Hello, everyone, and welcome to AGL Live. I'm Elizabeth Raley from Civic Actions, and I'm also on the working group of Agile Government Leadership. And today we're here with Mark Schwartz, who will be interviewed by Josh Seckel. For those joining who are new to AGL, we wanted to share a brief introduction. AGL is a nonprofit organization that provides Agile resources, information, and community to those working for or with government. This year, we are focusing on having an AGL Live every month, bringing conversations on topics ranging from government transformation to Agile procurement. Join us next month for a DevOps and security conversation and find past videos on our AGL YouTube channel. You can find out more about us, contact us, or sign up for our newsletter on our website, agilegovleaders.org. For today's session, we invite the audience to post questions in the Zoom chat channel, and I'll pass it over to Josh to continue introductions. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, my name is Joshua Seckel. I am also part of the AGL working group. Um, I am currently working at uh, Sevatech as a, as a chief solutions architect for Agile and DevOps. Um, but more importantly for this particular conversation, um, I actually uh, worked with Mark for several years at USCIS as, as a Fed and helped in that uh, transformation and, and have been very impressed with him. Um, so I'll give my very, sh I'll give, that's more than enough for, for me. Um, Mark, would you like to introduce yourself and then we can start with the uh, questions. Sure. I'm Mark Schwartz. I used to be the CIO at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services until uh, yeah, about seven or eight months ago, I guess. I'm also the author of two books, The Art of Business Value and A Seat at the Table, IT Leadership in the Age of Agility. Thanks. And where are you now? Where I am is Boston. Uh, it's a little bit cool, but most of the snow has melted. Awesome. Uh, I think we might get more this tonight. I'm told, yes. <laughs> so, so you've written the, these couple of, of lovely books. Um, one of, so in these books, you talk about realizing that um, IT is about delivering value, the lesson you learned from, from a previous CIO. Um, how do you translate uh, that delivering of value into the government space where it's not necessarily about dollars and cents per se? Right. It's, uh, it's a little bit tricky when you think about the government. I mean, on the, on the one hand, there is an equivalent perhaps to business value uh, as, as companies experience it. And that is that each agency is trying to deliver some sort of service and uh, delivering that service better is adding value in the same sense that delivering good products perhaps is value for business. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe there's a, another parallel that's not so obvious, which is that businesses have to, um, have, they have to satisfy, they have to keep happy the capital markets where, where their funding comes from. And in the government, there's an analogy to that as well which is maybe keeping Congress happy, uh, the appropriators happy. Um, so there's this dual objective in both cases of creating value for customers, creating value um, for whoever the consumers of your service are, and on the other hand, creating value for those who are funding you. Uh, but in the government, often the mission is a little bit hard to measure. I, I thought about this a lot as part of DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, because if your mission is, let's say, keeping the country safe from terrorists, how do you measure success exactly? Because um, you, you don't know how many terrorist incidents didn't happen, I guess, uh, or how many more would have happened if you weren't there. You know, there, there are all these negative things or negative occurrences that are hard to put your finger on. Uh, but in many ways, it is similar. You're, you're looking to um, deliver a service better, let's say. Um, that kind of leads into um, uh, one of the questions that we came up with here. Uh, in a recent interview, uh, Jen Hyman uh, of Rent the Runway um, 
has 1,200 employees with the majority of them in logistics and engineering, and only 10 in our fashion. Logistics and engineering are driving the business. And what ways do you see the government moving towards IT as, as a solution driving the business as opposed to IT as an accessory that, that is, <laughs> that's nice. Um, <laughs> and, is a, and is an afterthought, I, I suppose one might say. Yeah, you know, I, I read uh, some of those articles and I'm still wondering how you could have 1,200 people in engineering. You know, uh, it seems to me that, uh, at least if we're talking about software delivery or something like that, um, that's an awful lot of people, maybe the logistics part or, or some other sort of engineering. Uh, because really it's, so, uh, it's possible to do so much for the small team now, I think. Um, but... Um, in a way, maybe I, I would ask a different question, really. The, um, you know, you, you don't want government agencies generally to be IT organizations, ultimately. They, they have some other mission, and the other mission is the important thing. It might be a law enforcement mission, or we were in immigration. So the, uh, the agency is focused on making decisions about whether to grant somebody an immigration benefit. And that's really the core of it. So uh, it'll never be an IT organization, I think, to be realistic about it. But for me, the question is whether IT is part of um, designing the, the business or the agency. You know, is, is IT part of designing product and services, part of management part of um, formulating strategy for how to move the agency forward, as opposed to what I think is the old model really where there was something called the business and the business figured out what, uh, what the business should be, what its strategy should be, what its uh, operation should look like and, and what its objectives were, and then created requirements and tossed them over the wall to an IT organization and said, just do it. Um, you know, I think that's, that's the model that we're coming from in many ways. And that's true both in the commercial sector and in the government that if we really want to move into this digital age where the technology is such an important part of delivering those services, that the model of this arm's length relationship between the IT organization and something called the business doesn't, doesn't really hold. It doesn't really work if you want the, uh, the technology to be core to delivering the service. Hmm. That, that sounds like part of another question that you know, what does this table look like within the federal agency and that um, I've actually was just reading today that there is Congressman or Senator who is pushing to push organizations that don't have the CIO reporting directly to either the director or, or deputy director of the agency. Is that, is that a direction that will help actually have the CIO um, have this seat at the table and be part of making those decisions? Uh, it might. It's not a bad idea. Uh, but uh, ultimately, I think it, it depends on... Uh, personal relationships. You know, it's a, a CIO needs to have influence, and uh, it's not literal, literally about a seat at the table. It's not, you know, it's not about sitting there in a meeting with, with the head of the agency or whoever. Um, it's about being able to influence or thoroughly influence the direction of the agency. And so it depends partly on how good the CIO is at influencing the rest of the people, getting messages across, formulating ideas that are meaningful in the context of the agency, and uh, delivering those ideas as messages that people respond to. All of those things actually play into it. And on the other side, uh, if you report to the head of the agency and the agency, head of the agency still doesn't listen to you, that doesn't do a lot of good either, you know? So it's, um, it's really a matter of influence to me more than reporting structure, but the reporting structure is not a bad start. Cool. Um, a lot of government uh, IT leaders are keepers of governance, of the governance model, rather than deliverers of value per se. Um, administrators and paper pushers. So how can we change this paradigm? How did you change some of that paradigm at USCIS? 
So um, maybe the, the way to think about it is um, the traditional model to me is a model where you have executors, you know, people who are actually doing stuff, doing IT stuff in this case, and administrators where the relationship traditionally has been sort of a check and balance relationship or, uh, you know, got to keep an eye on the executors and that's the function of the administrators. I, I think that's an important function. That, that function needs to be there. there. There needs to be oversight of some sorts. There need, needs to be controls. Um, but the, the basic oppositional model tends to lead towards a way of thinking that is, um, it's about slowing things down. It's about establishing gate points and checkpoints and, and things like that, right? So in this, uh, maybe it's a, a straw man, you know, maybe it's, it's not as extreme as I'm describing it, although I, in my memory it is. Um, you know, you have executors who are trying to get things done, and then you have other people who are saying, wait a second, wait a second, uh, we need to check all these boxes and review all these things and, um, nope, it's not good enough, go back and do it again. Let's, let's slow down and, and, um, and not go charging to delivering product. And I, I think um, with the tools that we have these days, with what we've learned in the IT world, there's a much better way to do things. It's possible to have a lot of controls and a lot of governance and a lot of risk management and so on, and at the same time, speed up execution, actually, not slow it down. And uh, it changes the relationship, I think, a little bit between the executors and the administrators where they're not necessarily pushing against each other. Um, one of the techniques that we found in the IT world for establishing those controls is to automate quite a lot of them. So if you automate governance, if you automate oversight, especially when it comes to security, compliance, uh, transparency of different sorts, um, if you put in place these automated controls, then the executors can move very fast and at the same time be confident that they're complying, that what they're doing is under control, that it meets the needs of, of the administrators. So in that, in that model, the administrators are really the, the guardians of, of the automation, so to speak. You know, they're, they're deciding what things need to be enforced and then perhaps creating or having somebody create these automated controls that help them. Um, but then in, in that model, once you start moving in that direction, then the administrators and the executors are aligned. Both of them want to produce mission value, want to produce it quickly, inexpensively, uh, securely, reliably. Both are, are trying for the same thing. And the administration side can be supporting the execution side instead of slowing it down and saying, ah, not good enough. Uh, and both are, are sort of uh, accepting the automated controls as, as uh, the truth or as compliance. Um, so I, I think um, the model that, that we would like to move toward <clears throat> is one of controls, controls that are put in place at the beginning of an initiative and that remain throughout the initiative as guardrails <clears throat> that let executors deliver, uh, feel good about delivering, and at the same time establish the, uh, the constraints, let's say, under which they have to operate, in which case you don't need this, this head on head, uh, uh, I don't wanna say conflict, it's not exactly conflict, but uh, tension uh, between the two sides. Interesting. So talking about that head to head tension between the two sides, uh, obviously, in government work, we have a lot of contractors being the actual executors and, and so then our, with the, hey, we need these automated controls, we need the, is that then something that the government needs to improve their, their technical game, as it were? Or is it that we need another contractor to be a secondary creating controls that, that then validate the first contractors? <laughs> What 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 are the what's the the model here in terms of in terms of the technical competence that that you would expect in the 
in the federal in for federal employees versus the contractors? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I think there are lots of reasons why the government should be technical. I'm I'm not sure that this is one of them really. Um, the way I figure it, if you have uh, if you have a, a formal process, if you have compliance requirements, if you understand what, uh, what it means to be secure, then you can implement those things as tests. We did this at USCIS, for example, um, uh, for Section 508 compliance, compliance, for, uh, uh, compliance to providing capabilities for people with disabilities, uh, accessibility capabilities. So, um, for a long time, this, this felt like a squishy thing and somebody would come in at the end and test for Section 508 compliance. They'd find that the system wasn't compliant. You'd go to production anyway and feel guilty about it and try to fix it up later. Um, but to the extent that you can automate those tests for Section 508 compliance, which are you know, fairly well-defined, then you can be testing throughout your life cycle process. You could be making sure that you are compliant with Section 508 all the way through. So as um, conceptually, I, I thought, why can't we just extend that? If, if there's a compliance regime of some sort, well, it has some pretty exact requirements and let's automate those requirements and agree that to be compliant is to pass those tests. So does the automated script that tests for those things have to be written by the government or can it be written by a contractor on behalf of the government? Yeah, I don't, I don't feel too strongly. You know, it's, it's work like lots of other things. Um, but um, I, I think uh, the, the government in, um, in the way I like to work at least is very much a participant alongside the contractors. Um, I, I think it's a government responsibility to oversee what's being done, to oversee the contractors and the work they're doing. Um, and, and by the way, that's, that's very opposed to the older model. I keep referring to an older model as if it's a, a fixed thing. It's, it's not really fair. But, you know, the, the idea that you're going to use a systems integrator, you're going to get a big SI and you're just going to contract everything out to them and they'll manage themselves and do all the work and do the requirements and do, you know, in, in that model, it, it's always seemed to me like the government is punting on its fundamental responsibility to actually oversee things. Uh, it's essentially saying you you, the SI are responsible for overseeing and we'll oversee you a little bit. Um, so I think it's, it's a much more active involvement on the part of the government. And uh, in a world where product delivery is the most important thing, which I think it is, that means that the government needs to have some technical chops, you know, needs, needs to be able to make good decisions on technical directions, oversee what the contractor is doing technically, uh, have input into it and all of those things. So for other reasons, I would say that's important. Awesome. Uh, we have a, a question from, from the uh, chat here. Um, how, are you, how are you able to launch, how are you able to start changing the mindset at USCIS? And, you know, was it, was it you or other feds attempting Agile across DHS or, or even broader that you knew of? So the best advice that I can give you is if you want to launch an Agile transition, hire Josh and, and let him do it because uh, that was basically how I did it. Um, I, I think actually it was very powerful having um, the two of us who understood each other on the direction that we were going and we were able to support each other. Um, so uh, I don't know if Josh would agree with this. I, I should actually leave it open for Josh. But um, a, lot of what, um, I, a lot of what I had to think about as we were doing it uh, was the tension between command and control and agility or, or uh, self-organization team empowerment. Uh, because I was in a position where as CIO, uh, about 2,000 feds and contractors reporting to me, I was at the top of a big hierarchy with lots and lots of command and control power. And at the same time, when you're trying to become agile, what you're trying to do is not uh, manage through command and control. 
and empower teams and take a, a servant leadership sort of posture towards them uh, and remove impediments for them. So uh, how, how could I as, as CIO do that and um, maybe take advantage of my superpower that people listen to me when I talk, um, but at the same time not subvert the whole point. Um, so a uh, couple of things I discovered. One was that um, if a team is trying to do something and runs into impediments, and if they would ask me to remove those impediments for them, they were very happy if I used my command and control authority to remove the impediments, right? This is, this is something that people, uh, they actually love to see impediments go away, however they go away. So um, I was able to let the employees develop as agile practitioners and help them get obstacles to it out of the way. Um, so that's maybe sort of passive. On the active side, uh, I think that um, a lot of what I did perhaps was sort of like the, the martial arts framework of Shu Hari um, for, for how people learn new skills. So um, this is a, a framework. It's been brought up in an agile context many times before. It's probably a complete misunderstanding of Aikido and you know the, the original sources of it. But uh, the idea is that as people are changing, uh, one path that they often follow is a phase where they are doing things because they've been told to do them. You know, the, this, these are the new practices, do them. And in the martial arts, it's usually the, the master who's respected, who's saying, do it this way. Uh, and they don't necessarily understand why they're doing things that way, but they're doing them. And then over time, they start to understand what they're doing and why and to internalize it. That's the ha phase. Uh, and then in the re phase, it starts to um, uh, penetrate or they, they absorb it to the extent that they can actually be creative with the new practices. They can invent new things. They can bring in other influences and, um, and forget the things that they were told to do. Um, so, uh, because I had this command and control authority, uh, I was perhaps able to start this shuhadi process going by saying, here are agile practices, do them. Um, the, uh, you don't want that to be the end state. Right? You, don't, you don't want people following the agile practices just because somebody said do so. But uh, I think we were uh, confident that as people started to practice the right things, they would see why they were practicing those things and it, and it would become very obvious to them. Um, let me uh, maybe give you an example, um, which Josh was firsthand witness to as well. This was um, the role of QA in the Agile process. And uh, we were coming from the, the traditional government environment where QA's responsibility was to, at the end of a development process, come in, do some testing, and say, no, the quality is not good enough. You better go back and do it over. Um, as we started to move into the Agile world, I said, that's, that's not the way QA is going to work. It doesn't work that way. We can't have a gatekeeper at the end. QA's job is to make sure everything is produced with high quality in the first place. That's the role of, of QA. Uh, and that, that caused a little bit of discomfort, but we worked with the, the leaders of QA and came up with a set of practices that made sense for putting QA in that role. Uh, for example, QA would attend certain standups, they would audit automated tests that the developers were creating uh, or that the teams were creating and make sure those tests tested for the right things. They would evaluate the teams against um, good agile practices and give the teams feedback that they could use in order to improve their practices and so on. So we, we came up with a set of practices for QA that made sense and told QA, do it, you know, do, do it this way. And uh, after a while, the practices started to seem like the obvious way to do things. And my measure of that is that whenever we would bring in speakers from other agencies who were trying to make agile transformations, 
uh, and sat, sit down with them uh, and discuss best practices and what we're seeing. If the people from the other agency ever said something that wasn't truly agile, you could see everybody around the table wincing. You know, you could, you could see all the QA people saying, mm, you know, why? Um, that's strange. Uh, the fact that they had this gut level reaction to anything that wasn't really agile kind of told me that they were absorbing the ideas uh, and it was starting to feel natural to them. And then um, the, the truly spectacular thing, I think, was uh, the thing that told me that we had entered that last phase, the, the re phase, uh, which was that the, the head of QA came to me and he said, um, if I'm in charge of making sure that everything is high quality, I should be in charge of training the developers. And I thought, well, that's really weird. I've never heard of QA training the developers. You know, this is a very odd idea, but you know what? <laughs> it actually makes sense given what we're trying to accomplish. If QA is in charge of making sure quality is there from the start, why shouldn't they be in charge of training? Um, so it was a total surprise. Uh, it certainly wasn't standard practice, but it was proposed by somebody who obviously had internalized the, the key point and was being creative with it. So uh, I think uh, maybe that was at the root of how we turned the agency agile, but uh, Josh probably knows a lot more than I do. <laughs> I don't know about knowing more than you do. I will say that, that uh, while at USCIS with you, it was, it was nice to, to have that top cover, but, but there was definitely a, uh, I learned a lot about meeting people where they are <laughs> CIS, and then, and then evolving them from there, but making sure to meet them from where they are, which I'll, I'll slightly rephrase, but this question from Bob in the uh, chat, um, one of the things for me that, that said, oh, Agile really is here, is not when I was talking to QA or to some of the developers, but when I was talking to some of the product owners and the business people who said, I don't care if Mark leaves, I don't care if you leave, we're not going back to the previous way we're staying agile. So mm -hmm. for some of the things that you did up above that in the SES level and of the managers of the business units uh, that you worked with in order to help them understand, hey, or I don't know, procurement, um, and come around to, to understanding and, and helping make this transformation real. Yeah, I, I think um, that, that was very successful for us um, because uh, I, I think the, um, the owners of, of the business systems or the, or the uh, line of business owners, um, they got used to uh, working in this style and uh, once again, it just started to seem like the normal way of doing things, even if they started out being a little uncomfortable with it or, or feeling like they had objections. But um, convincing them to go in that direction, uh, maybe it comes back to that question of influence and, and CIOs wielding influence. Um, it's, a, it's a sales problem in many ways, and I, I mean sales without any negative connotations. Um, if you're going to go to a business leader and say, uh, well, we want to do this new thing that's called Scrum, and it means you have to rewrite all your requirements as user stories, and, um, and we're not going to tell you uh, what's going to get done when, and you're going to have to come to all sorts of meetings, including, uh, you know, sprint reviews and, and uh, be available all the time if the developers have quite, you know, um, maybe that's not the best way to sell the idea. Um, I think the, the sell is, uh, Mr. Business Owner, um, is it okay if we start delivering what you want tomorrow instead of waiting a couple more years for it? And um, it, how about if we, uh, instead of going off and doing a bunch of stuff, we check with you as we're doing it to make sure it meets your needs. Is that okay? And uh, it's hard to say no to something like that. And it's even harder once the deliveries have started. I mean, if you're, you've set up a nice DevOps pipeline, you have a lean process, you've shortened your cycle times, um, then where before they saw you spending two years and releasing a buggy product, now they're saying, 
every day new stuff is coming out that actually helps them. And it's exactly the stuff that has the right impact because they or their employees have been very busy uh, helping or participating or directing and giving feedback. Um, so it, it's not a hard sell, really. There, there's a reason why we use agile practices. And that reason is that they're really successful. <laughs> and so uh, it sells itself, really. Um, and it's not about those ceremonies and, and uh, funny terminology. Cool. Um, so over time, before you, before you ever became, we spent many, many years in the federal government developing this SDLC. If we're moving into Agile, what do we do with all of this accumulated knowledge that's sitting in this great SDLC or not? The paper is probably recyclable, I would think, at least. Um, I, I think um, the thing to do is to take a step back from the SDLC. It's, uh, let's pretend it's not a starting point that we're moving incrementally from, but say, what, what is that SDLC there to accomplish? What, why do we have an SDLC? What are we trying to do? And what does success look like? Because obviously we're trying to facilitate success. So to me, success in an IT investment is that you deliver capabilities to the business, that uh, you deliver them fast, you deliver them cost effectively, you uh, deliver them at a high level of quality, reliability, security, and that you reduce the risk that all of this is gonna take place, right? That's, to me, that's, that's what an SDLC should be for. Uh, if we're gonna have one at all, it should be to try to facilitate those outcomes. So what would an SDLC look like to facilitate those outcomes? And I think based on everything that we've learned in the IT world over the last 20 years or so, um, our traditional SDLCs are not written to facilitate those outcomes. So for example, um, if the SDLC has a checkpoint that says we're gonna review the requirements and make sure the requirements are complete and well thought out and signed off on by everybody, et cetera, uh, that might've sounded like a good way to reduce risk before. But uh, in fact, the consequence of it is that you have a long period of assembling requirements and it costs a lot of money to assemble those requirements. It takes a lot of time. Um, and we just said that some of the goals of the SDLC are to get product to users quickly and cost effectively. So it's probably not doing that exactly. Uh, is it mitigating risk? Um, well, uh, thinking about all the uh, things you're gonna build in the system before you actually start doing it and have, have something to show to people, uh, often that results in something that's not quite what the, the people who are gonna use it need or that's not gonna have the business impact that you think. So is it more risk mitigating to test out your hypotheses by creating things or to not test out your hypotheses and make a, a plan based on your hypotheses? Uh, so I think given the state of practice and uh, the goals of an SDLC, an SDLC would have to look rather different from what it looks like now. It would have to be about delivering quickly and getting constant feedback, re-evaluating decisions to proceed very often, regularly, but based on uh, actual experience and things that have been delivered. Um, it should uh, emphasize um, testing hypotheses, trying things out, uh, being able to evolve an architecture, all of those things that we know to be good practices. So I don't think there's anything wrong with an SDLC per se. Um, it's more that uh, we should take the goals that we have in trying to establish the SDLC and figure out what is the best way to get practice to adhere to accomplishing those goals. Cool. I want to take another question from the chat. I'll phrase it a little bit. Um, 
So often there are large projects in, in federal government, Ellis verification modernization, uh, others that are very large, um, Sentinel, et cetera. To approach such a project, would you want to work with one big contractor who can do everything or several small contractors that will need more government coordination and, and cross contractor collaboration and coordination? I don't think it matters necessarily. You're, you're working with a number of teams that have to coordinate their activities. And I think that can be done with one contractor, with a number of contractors. What, uh, what's important is that you get teams with skills, uh, the appropriate skills and with the appropriate uh, agile uh, spirit, let's say, uh, the ability to work together, to communicate, all of those things. Uh, so for me, it's about those teams and less about the contractors that they come from. Um, I think uh, the assumption was made before that you can coordinate those teams better if they all come from the same contractor. But I think we found plenty of ways to do that, even if they're drawn from different contractors. I think um, in order to make sure that you always have high performing teams, it has turned out sometimes to be better to have those teams be drawn from different contractors who have to uh, compete to supply the best teams. Um, but if there's a contractor out there who can provide me with, what do we use, 15 agile teams for transformation or something. If there's a contractor who can give me 15 agile teams uh, who are uh, uh, very powerful, capable teams with the right spirit, with the right attitude, and can sustain that over the long term, that's great. They might as well all come from one contractor. In practice, we found that that wasn't happening and that it worked a lot better to uh, work with a number of contractors, with a number of teams from each contractor, and uh, keep a, a constant uh, uh, incentive for the contractors to make sure they were supplying us with really good teams and training and managing those teams to deliver what we were looking for. Awesome. Um so I, I know at USCIS, we started with one, pro, with one project that was tiny and at Rayo and then grew it. So what are some of the uh, insight into how we scaled Agile? What worked, what didn't work in order to make USCIS an Agile delivery instead of just having a program or two here and there? I think, um Wow, there were a lot of things we did. Uh, <laughs> come to think of it, I was going to give a simple answer, and then I then I thought, no, nah, not so easy. Um, so, uh, to me, the the there maybe are two questions there. It's scaling a single project uh, and getting it to be a big project, and then there's scaling the transformation across the entire enterprise, uh, and both needed to happen for us within a single initiative scaling. Um, the technique that worked well for us in the end, I think, was being very clear about a set of objectives that the program was supposed to accomplish, a set of measurable business objectives, and then letting the teams work together with the goal of accomplishing those objectives. Um, I think what, what works less well from my experience is making a big batch of requirements and then chopping those requirements up and feeding some of them to each team. Uh, because then you, you get into this world where they have conflicting incentives and you know team A is busy with one set of work but team B needs their help but they're you know still trying to finish their work so they don't have time to help. You know that there are conflicting objectives if you just take all the requirements, um, chop them up and assign them to teams. So what worked a lot better for us in the end, I think, was this set of teams, your goal is to move this particular business metric. And you should do whatever it takes to move this business metric, you're in it together, figure it out. And then they have incentive to 
collaborate with each other. They have their eye on the right thing. You know, the, we're, we're measuring their success based on what we really care about. Uh, and uh, instead of trying to manage thousands of requirements and distributing them between teams, you're managing a small set of objectives and, um, and uh, getting feedback on whether they're succeeding or not and managing from that. Uh, when it comes to scaling across the enterprise, um, I think uh, what, what I've seen be effective is for people who have skills to be working with people who don't yet have the skills and have those people learning from the, the ones who, who have more experience. So you can, you can send everybody to training, that accomplishes something, that, that gets the ball moving, that, that gets some skills there. But a lot of the skills that we're talking about, uh, especially with my focus on actually creating product, you know, actually doing the software engineering, they're technical skills and they're learned from experience. And with a set of tools or techniques that requires a very different mindset, it's hard to acquire that mindset if you're doing it on your own, whereas if you're working alongside people who already have that mindset, it's constantly being reinforced around you. So um, I think uh, when we had people, let's say, who had skills and experience working in the cloud and put them together working with teams that hadn't worked in the cloud yet, um, the skill transfer was a lot quicker than it would have been otherwise. And when we, uh, uh, maybe it, it was still an unsolved problem when I left, but getting all of the agile teams good at writing automated tests, for example, was a very hard practice to learn. And uh, the places where I saw it be successful was when there was this kind of pairing between developers. A developer worked with somebody else who had those skills writing automated tests uh, even uh, if it was within a contractor team, let's say, and the tech lead from the contractor was working with the people on the team to transfer those skills. So I, I think uh, a lot of interaction and uh, kind of a mesh of interactions, you know, lots of, lots of people working with lots of people is a fast way to transfer skills across the entire enterprise. Cool. Um... If you had to start over, uh, if you were just coming into USCIS, knowing what you know now, um, i.e., oh wait, you're going to go into some other agency now and start a transformation there. What kinds of advice for must do, must not do would you give knowing what you know now? Hmm. Yeah. Uh... I think that what it takes is a combination of a very strong vision, big vision, combined with very small execution. So I've seen, and I, I, you know, I see this in, in what I'm doing now also, talking to lots of companies. Um, sometimes you've got leaders or people within an organization who have a, a beautiful grand vision of where they're going and that grand vision causes them to go into analysis paralysis essentially you know here's this big beautiful vision and uh how are we going to get there how are we going to get there you know every idea that they might act on it's not good enough they're they're going for this big thing and so it's very hard to get started and actually get moving towards that vision because it's too grand a vision. On the flip side, if you just do a lot of disconnected small things, then it's going to take a really long time for them to add up to a big thing and um, uh, people won't understand as well where they're going, what they're trying to accomplish. So uh, what I would adv advise an agency is Think big picture about uh, direction that you want to go. In our case, uh, what I was thinking about was fast responsiveness to mission needs. How, how are we going to turn things that are taking us a decade now into taking us days or you know hours to do? Um, 
start with that big vision, but execute very small, constantly say to yourself, what's the smallest thing I can do right now that will lead towards where that vision wants to take me? And what's the smallest experiment I can try that will give me some learnings about how to get there? Uh, and the question should always be, what's the smallest thing? And at the same time, be in the context of this bigger vision. How's that? Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so wh while you're doing that, and I'm going to pull from William Taylor here, um, what <laughs> kind of um, incentives uh, help? And he's looking for admin, but also beyond that, as you're starting that transformation, what kinds of incentives help people get on board that, yeah, let's make this move, not just ITPMs, but also your administrative groups? <laughs> when... Uh, when I was at USCIS, one thing that I found very consistently was that people very often had great ideas. They, they wanted to move in a direction and they, they had good ideas on how to do it and at the same time felt helpless. You know, they're like, well, we could never do that. You know, here's what we would do, but I don't even know why you're asking what we would do because we can't do any of this because the SDLC says this and the acquisition process says this and procurement says, you know. Um, there is, uh, there's so much energy and desire, I think, uh, and people might not be thinking uh, that what they're looking for is to be agile, but they are, you know, they're, they're looking for the ability to do the things that are really obvious to them um, and feel very constrained. And so I, I don't think it's about incentivizing and saying, you know, if you, if you can uh, uh, get a lot done in a two week sprint, then you're going to get a bonus or, you know, not that kind of incentives. I, I think there's a lot of room for harnessing people's desire to do a good job and to fulfill the mission of the agency. And it's a, uh, it's a question of aligning all of those desires to do a good job, to um, uh, effectively administer the immigration system. Um, everybody around the agency has those desires and it's a matter of taking those desires and saying, do it, you know, I'll, I'll cover for you. I'll, I'll get things out of your way. You, you now have permission to do the things that you know are the right things to do. Uh, so that's how I would think about it. Cool. Um, so I'm going to kind of combine Tim and, and another question here. You've done, you've done this, uh, in, uh, in commercial before you came to USCIS, now at USCIS, you're out talking to lots of different um, folks. Have you found a place where, where Agile, this fast delivery shouldn't apply um, or it isn't really uh, the, the right thing to do? Uh, I'll give the flip answer, which is no, um, in, in the sense that for me, being agile, by definition, what it means is inspecting and adapting. It, it means not being a slave to a plan, but learning as you go and adjusting what you're doing based on your learning. And so your question is, are there cases where even though you've learned something, you want to make sure you don't use that learning? And I don't think there are. Um, at least I can't think of places where there are. Um, in any complex environment, it's very important to be learning and experimenting and shifting course as it, as it makes sense to, uh, rather than ignoring what you're learning. And I think uh, IT in any organization is that kind of a complex environment. But uh, I, I'm open-minded enough to think that maybe someday somebody will show me a place where it does make sense to ignore your learnings. Cool. Um, that actually kind of brings me to a, you're an inspect and adapt and uh, your teams are running regular retrospectives. How, how do you bring that learning up a level to your organization as opposed to having teams 
um, splinter off in many different directions. I've, uh, maybe I've become a fan of the idea that people should just talk to each other. <laughs> you know, it's uh, maybe, maybe one of the, the uh, things that feels very different about being in the commercial sector um, or at least, <laughs> yeah, I see somebody says, no kidding, <laughs> can't, can't argue with that. Um, you know, I, I, uh, when we were working with U.S. Digital Services at one point, and there were a bunch of Google uh, people working with us, I asked them, you know, like, um, well, if you need something from another team, how, how do you get it? Uh, and they said, well, we asked them. And, uh, and I, I thought, yeah, but surely there's something wrong with that, right? The other team is working on other things and can't be bothered. And, um, you know, you maybe need some layers of management to get involved. So, that, you know, but uh, no, actually, they talk to each other and they ask each other for help and they help each other. Um, so uh, I, I, I think there should be a lot more informal exchange uh, that we've gotten used to inhibiting in at least our USCIS environment, probably across the government, because we are very focused on silos and the accountability of silos. We have work environments that are not conducive to informal exchanges, meaning everybody's in a little cube and um, doesn't interact with the people around them. Uh, there are a lot of barriers to that kind of informal exchange. I think the biggest barrier being well, you're accountable for getting this stuff done, so don't waste time talking to those people over there when they need help uh, and discouraging it. So I think best practices can, or learnings can pass a lot more quickly when you have a lot more informal exchange. Um, how can you systematize capturing best practices and passing them around? Um, I, I think, uh, well, one, one interesting idea is that whole Spotify model, right? The tribes and guilds kind of thing, which I, I think is, is done pretty much for this purpose. You know, if you're, if you're working in product teams where the people on your team are a variety of different specialties, but the same product or um, uh, part of the business, then you still need some good ways to exchange ideas between people in your functional specialty. And so they've created this sort of matrixy um, uh, kind of informal loose matrix where people can bond this way and bond this way and pass good ideas around. But uh, maybe that's the best I can do. I don't know that I've solved this one. Okay. Um, can, um, we've got about seven minutes left. Can you, can you talk a little bit about um, the culture change that the DevOps in particular, but I would argue the entire agile transformation has, has brought to USCIS. Yeah, uh, actually I'm just looking at the questions and uh, I feel like answering the one before it first. Um, <laughs> Iqbal Tareen's question. Um, so uh, comparing the commercial and the commercial sector and government sectors, who's ahead in DevOps, Agile transformation, and so on, um, uh, you might be surprised, really. Uh, I, what I found is that um, there's less difference between government and commercial and more difference between large enterprises and small organizations. So large enterprises, whether they're in the government or in the commercial sector, have a lot of similar issues, challenges. Um, and the challenges in those large organizations uh, revolve around the fact that they're trying to transform, but they have legacy stuff. And it's as true in the commercial world as in government, there's all this legacy ways of doing things, legacy systems, uh, legacy rules and all, all that kind of thing. And those legacy things were put in place because they were considered to be the best solution in the old world. And now that you're transforming, you have to somehow undo a lot of that stuff. And it's just as true in the commercial world. So um, uh, 
my experience is that people in both sectors, when it comes to large enterprises, are pushing against those, those difficulties, trying to find solutions. And I wouldn't say that one or the other is ahead, uh, government or commercial. However, small startups are in a very different situation. They don't have legacy. They're, they're inventing themselves for the first time. And they don't really have to transform. They just do what they do. And so often the picture of the commercial sector that the government has is uh, looking at those small companies, uh, or new companies at least, and how well they're doing at transforming. But that's not really the right comparison. It's, it's large to large versus small to small, I think. Um, so DevOps and culture change. Um, I think the most important thing about DevOps is that it's based on a principle of fast feedback. I, you know, there are lots of different things you can point to in DevOps. Uh, there's uh, doing away with the, uh, the wall between development and operations. Yes, that's a very important part of the cultural change. But I think when you, when you look across the entire enterprise, the big cultural change or the big technical change, let's start with that, is that DevOps is about let's shorten our cycle time and get things to production, get things into the hands of users, and then get feedback very quickly when the users use it. And that feedback is partially what the users think of it, but it's also objective data that you're gathering, like A-B testing or monitoring and reporting on the results and things like that. Get that feedback, feed it right back into your development process, and keep improving the product by having that very fast feedback. So the big cultural change that has to go with that is you have to start thinking in terms of, uh, it's almost a kind of humility. It's like, I don't know everything about this product that I'm creating, even though I think I do, but I'm going to be surprised when people start using it. And it's going to, you know, a lot of my ideas about what's the right thing for these users, the, my ideas are probably wrong, even though I'm an expert. So it's more important for me to make my ideas explicit as hypotheses and test those hypotheses and learn from the way the, the stuff is actually used. That's how you take advantage of a fast feedback cycle. And the cultural change is we're all... Uh, uh, incentivized or trained to um, act like experts. You know, that's why we're being paid, right? People, people pay us the big bucks because we're experts on what those users need. And uh, DevOps ultimately is a way of admitting that uh, you're not really that expert. You know, users are surprising. Um, uh, uh, consequences of doing something are somewhat unpredictable in a complex, chaotic environment. And uh, the right way to approach it, if you're very good at what you do, is to try experiments, get feedback, and mold your, your product. Uh, and that's a very big cultural change. Cool, thank you. Um, so we have a, I'm gonna ask one more question, I think. And this is, this is my question because I, I, I enjoy your, your response to this. Um, one of the things that we are obviously saddled with within the government is a large bureaucracy. And I know that I heard you talk before about how bureaucracy is not necessarily a bad thing. Hmm. So could you, could you give us a little bit of, of your views on bureaucracy uh, to close us out? Yeah. Uh, when bureaucracy first became the thing, um, it was considered a great thing. Uh, the alternative to bureaucracy in many ways is um, arbitrariness, uh, nepotism, um, uh, people making up rules on the spot. Uh, bureaucracy is meant to institutionalize the best practices as rules and then apply those rules consistently, and that means fairly. Um, so as annoying as it might be in a lot of cases, at least bureaucracy makes sure that there is this kind of fairness. The same rules apply to everybody and apply to all cases. The, uh, the way bureaucracy is created usually is that in the act of doing whatever you're doing, you discover some practices that work really well. And so you systematize those practices. You say, here's the way we're gonna do it because this is what works well. 
And then that system becomes your bureaucracy. It becomes a set of rules. Do it this way because that works well. Um, so as a way of uh, almost storing information, you know, storing those best practice ideas, representing them, um, bureaucracy, the rules are a very efficient way to, to store that information about what has worked in the past and make sure that's used in the future. The difficulty with bureaucracy, of course, is that those rules don't necessarily keep changing as more and more is learned as circumstances change, um, you know, all the other reasons. Um, the problem is not necessarily the bureaucracy itself, the fact that you're based on rules and based on a meritocracy. The problem is that you can't change those rules so easily. Uh, what you need is a, a learning bureaucracy, a bureaucracy that can be um, inspected and adapted and uh, continuously improved. Um, that doesn't solve all of your problems of figuring out the best way to do things, but it does let you capture this accumulated knowledge of what actually works. So I don't think bureaucracy per se is a problem, uh, but we, I think we're all aware of uh, how bureaucracy often does become a problem. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time, Mark, and we greatly appreciate you, you taking the opportunity to, to share with us your, your wisdom, your knowledge that you've gained. Thank you. Yes, thank you both, and thanks to the audience for watching and participating today. If you're looking to continue the conversation, please join us um, on our website or on LinkedIn. You can find us at agilegovleaders.org, and we'll share a video there as well. Um, next month, we're doing uh, an AGL Live on DevOps and security. So we hope to see you all there. And thanks again, Josh and Mark. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.